Hi, I'm Mara Webster with InCreative Company, and thank you so much for tuning into one of our talks today. I'm so thrilled today to be joined by the fantastic Tobias Menzies to talk all about Netflix's The Crown. And I love the way that you've always described how there's a really interesting, almost restrictive element to playing Philip in the show because he's not someone who ever really expressed his personal life or expressed emotion in the same way in public. And so as much research as you had from the team on the show, that was the side that you really had to create and shape yourself. And so I was interested in having done two seasons as him now, how you found new spaces where you were able to just continue filling in his emotional life and a lot of the aspects behind the scenes as you shaped that. Yeah, I mean, yes, it was the, maybe the central, or at least one of the central um, challenges, but also sort of meditations of that part, I think, felt like, um, was about emotion because, yeah, they don't show very much, um, or unless they, they try not to show very much. Um, I always felt like watching uh, The Real Queen and The Real Philip, so I always got a lot more from Philip, um, but it was clearly um, coming off him, sort of against his will. It's sort of coming out in his sort of his physicality and his sort of little attempts at humor and sometimes his irritation. And so he, it, there's a lot, you felt there's a lot of energy and emotional energy kind of in his body, I always thought. But um, so much of their job is to withhold that and, rest and restrain it. And so, I mean, that fundamentally is a bit of a gift for an actor really because um, it gives, you know, an inherent tension within him, which I think is inherently dramatic to watch, I think, to, but obviously then you have the kind of the acting challenge of how do you communicate what's going on without communicating. <laughs> you know, there's, there's, there's like a sort of uh, a deep contradiction there. Um, and so, yeah, so it was, yeah, so toggling around the different kind of issues of that was sort of 95% of the, of, the, um, of the job really. And in essence, when you look at him as a character within the show, there's almost three different versions of of where he gets to be in terms of his intimacy, how relaxed he is, you know, his relationship with Elizabeth and the dynamic between the two of them, because we have the space where they're front facing, where there's public engagements, which you were talking about. Then we have the moments where they're at home, but very frequently surrounded by all of their family members. There's always stuff within earshot. So it's still not a fully relaxed atmosphere. And then mm. there's the quiet moments with just the two of them, such as, you know, when they're saying goodnight to each other and it's just the two of them in the bedroom. Um, and so, so how did you kind of, when you look at the more intimate scenes where maybe it's just him and Elizabeth in a room together, how do you look at the way in which you really want to make him just slightly more stripped down each point we get to less and less people being around the two of them until we get to those really intimate spaces together? Yeah, you put it very, very well. Um, um, the presence of others, um, the public nature of their lives is absolutely woven into the, the fabric of it completely. And so, and, and the, the, a big part of the show, I think the appeal of the show is the moments when you get to go backstage, as it were, for those moments when they're saying goodnight. And because that's the kind of tickly kind of as if-ness of the show, I think is, yeah, it feels a bit magic to, oh yeah, maybe, maybe that is what they're like, or oh, yeah, that's interesting. I, and, so, and I guess performatively is maybe this, as you put it quite well, again, that it's a question of, um, what is it, sort of uh, volume, I think. And you do have the opportunity to maybe take the volume down and for them to be at their most ordinary. So just a man and a wife, arguably, or, you know, a father and a daughter. So we get into the sort of gentler textures of, that they're just they're just people they're just families they're just this family that's trying to sort of live inside this um, this arcane structure. Um, so yeah, I think I mean yeah, mainly they're, 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 I think I mean I think they're the scenes often that I enjoyed the most it was the kind of domestic stuff, um, all the stuff with kid the kids, you know, even the sort of not 
good kid stuff, you know, like Charles in episode one of season nine, you know, after Mountbatten's death, where, you know, Philip really falls short of being you know, the best he could be as a father. Um, but all that is always feels so juicy because I think it just, it feels like the epic part of the show. It's the personal inside the, the public. And, that's and, and a lot of his journey within the show has been about him really kind of settling into that space of duty and the marriage that he entered into. And, you know, the earlier seasons, we saw him struggling with that. And it feels like, you know, this season in particular, he feels incredibly comfortable with it. And especially as he's watching Diana's journey into the family and he sees that kinship. But what I love watching with the dynamic with him and Elizabeth is the fact that there's different ways that he supports her when they're out in public, when they're in front of people, when they're at a ceremonial event. You know, sometimes it's just about him saying a quiet aside to her or where he physically stands to be near her so that, he, you know, she feels his physical presence. And that's very different to the conversation that they're having at home when she's fretting about whether she raised her children the right way and whether she has been a good mother. And there's but there's also a dance and I was interested in that dance for you in finding where it is that he steps in and he gives a lot of verbal support and he's really there for her and where he kind of starts to recognize a lot more in the show now about when he just needs to kind of take a back seat and the best thing that he can do for her is just be there as a physical presence. Yeah, I mean, obviously a lot of those decisions are, are made in terms of script, um, you know, by Peter uh, and the writers. Um, but yeah, I guess there is an extra layer of kind of the tone of that. So, you know, how how he doesn't say something or how he does say something or and the sort of negotiation of or seeing those sort of decisions in the, to do those things. Um, I also think the other thing I'd add to that list is humour um, that, you know, using and that definitely felt like it was a big, it does seem to me watching them as a big, part of their relationship, the real Philip and the real um, Elizabeth, is that he is someone who is able to make her laugh and also able to kind of puncture the solemnity of a lot of these events, the kind of formality, and he kind of pokes it and, uh, yeah, sort of tries to sort of make it um, human, I think, and make it alive. And I get the sense that that's so helpful for her because she's clearly a slightly more reserved person and not doesn't it doesn't it always enable to do that so he can kind of be the punk in the room and um and yeah i think if i was having to do her job i think i would uh, it would be nice to have someone like phil around i think did you find that when you were shaping what the cadence and what his voice comedically was going to be for scenes like that, because there's so many of them, that that was actually a space where a lot of the, the research materials came into play because that was something that we got to see elements of in public spaces as well. And it did kind of slip out on camera a lot of times. Mm -hmm. um, and, but even in terms of being able to take the public element of looking at his sense of humor and carry it through to a quieter moment, such as when he's goading Elizabeth about, well, I know who your favorite child is, and then he just quietly walks away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, I guess that's the, the fun bit, sort of uh, finding what you feel like is the seed of something in, in them and in the footage and um, in your research and then finding homes for that in, in you know, in sort of little corners uh, as you sort of move through. So, um, I mean, in terms of the technicalities of the voice, yeah. Um, I mean, it's a few years now, obviously, before, since I actually started on that journey. Uh, it mainly was just listening to him until my ears bled, really. Um, I think the main challenge with doing such a particular and such a recognisable voice uh, is that it can feel unnatural. So, you know, it has to feel like your voice, uh, you have to get it sort of deep enough into your muscles that you're kind of, you're not having to work too hard. It doesn't feel too performative. Um, so there was sort of no replacement for just kind of, kind of getting almost to the level where you're bored of it and then you can sort of just forget about it and then hopefully just play the scene. And um, because I think that those technical qualities, movement and voice always were there really to be close enough that then the audience can feel relaxed and then sort of pass through that 
and then they're just into the family drama or the political drama or they're just into the personalities and what's going on and they're not having to worry about you know the, the techniques of it yeah and one of the things in terms of the directing on the show that i think gives us really beautiful insight again to that internal side of a lot of the characters is the way that the camera often going into or out of a scene will often just frame and sit on a character for a moment so for example there's the conversation that philip and elizabeth are having where it's the first time that he's learned about the code names for anyone's passing in the family and then the camera just sits on you for a moment as you're processing that and what does that give you in terms of your performance in having those extra beats and having those extra internal moments to really just process a lot of details from what's either about to happen in a scene or the discussion that's just gone on? That's a really interesting question, a really granular question. The, uh, the honest truth is you're not really in control of that stuff. I mean, you do your work and you, but in a way that decisions are post-production in terms of the edit. So, you know, they, they have that footage, but choosing to stay for that moment and is, yeah, that's a gift really of the, of the editor and the director. Um, and, you know, and maybe you give them something in the performance, they kind of go, okay, I want to stay here for that. But um, yeah, I, I, I've never been that interested in kind of being in control to that extent, you know, I have filmed with actors who, you know, want to see everything back, and but that's not really how we, or certainly how I worked, and certainly not how we worked on The Crown. Um, a, just partly time-wise, but yeah, uh, yeah, I think you, at some level, you kind of also want to just give it up and just play it, and then hope that there's enough in there that you know they have. But I think they always, I mean, obviously they always have that footage because they always know that, that is part of the language of the film, of the, of the series is, and often it's framed, you know, it's often against these very ornate rooms to so get again, the sort of the personal against the political, against the, um, the institution. You know, obviously that famous um, trope within the show of the you know, back of the headshot where you're looking at the back of them and you're really looking at what they're sitting inside and all that stuff is really you don't worry about that. You know? I also wanted to talk about the the kinship between Philip and Diana as she starts to become part of the family because I think that trajectory feels like there's a dynamic between the two of them and a connection between the two of them because he understands exactly what she's going through more than anybody else in the room. And also at the same time, it feels like it actually makes him feel confident in himself in that he's navigated this and he he realizes that he actually understands a lot of it now in a way that maybe he didn't at the beginning in watching her. And so I was interested in how you wanted to approach those scenes with her and the impact that you felt that it had on him in being around her and getting to watch her journey in this season. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right that um, the, you know, the story that Peter wanted to show or tell was that she is do making the same journey that he has already made. And in some ways, he's, he clearly is very beguiled by her, um, maybe even sort of falls in love with her at some level. Um, and all of those things, I think, both the kind of his sense of um, uh, kinship with her and his, um, how much he likes her, arguably, I think, blinds him to who maybe who she really is. And it certainly doesn't allow him to give his son the support and the advice that maybe he needs. And so he ends up really kind of bullying his son into something that ultimately isn't the right thing. And so, the, again, those tensions feel really good and really kind of Greek in that, you know, obviously, every viewer watching it knows where it goes and so I, I like the way that it, Peter's writing sort of leads into that so you know there's a kind of yeah there's a, a sinking feeling a, a sense of dread for free really in the telling of that story and so it's very interesting to have you know um, Philip um, kind of uh, really there's a level of transference going on he sort of is getting too attached to involved in her as 
as an idea, you know, and it kind of blinds it. And when it comes to costumes, the costumes go well beyond, you know, the public front facing costumes and, and really kind of glorious outfits, but they also tell a lot of story about character within the show. And when we look at the scene where Philip and Diana go hunting together, the fact that their outfits almost fully match in terms of color palette, in terms of detail, in terms of what they're wearing. Um, and so for you, how do you find that a lot of the costume details really help you to take a further look and, and a further layer into a lot of the character dynamics and relationships in individual scenes. Yeah, it's very interesting. I hadn't actually noticed that when you said it. I mean, this is the genius of uh, Amy Roberts, uh, who, you know, who designed all the costumes and yeah, I think does an extraordinary job in exactly the way that you've just shown. Again, um, the truth is, that actually you can't get up in the grill of that stuff too much because that's kind of external third eye and in a way you just have to sort of be in there and you know look down in the eye and sort of try and mean what you're saying <laughs> and not forget your lines and all those kind of very prosaic things. Um, I think, yeah, the joy of all that stuff is in the viewing really because all those, you know, what, I mean, what's brilliant about the show is that you have a lot of people at the top of their game really contributing and feeding into you know what you're doing and but the, the honest truth is a lot of the time you're aware about five percent of it yeah so <laughs> <laughs> you're like we're like sort of huge babies that have no idea what's going on but we're just in the middle of it you know <laughs> I was also interested in a lot of the dynamics for Philip as a parent in this series in particular because, you know, looking at the episode where literally there's entire conversations and dynamics exploring, you know, oh, okay, Anne's my favourite, who's Elizabeth's favourite? And so it really felt like this season even more so, there was such an opportunity to really explore the different threads and the different dynamics that he has with each of his children as a mm. parent. And so I just wanted to ask you about the opportunity to really explore those relationship dynamics at a deeper level through storylines like that? Yeah, I mean, obviously I'd, I'd, we'd done a fair, we built the relationship with that, um, Anne quite well, uh, you know, prior to this season and that continued and that was, you know, always um, such a great, um, you know, she's so brilliant and also it's a relationship that I think is really enjoyable to watch. They're sort of bees from a pod and they kind of, they're similar and that's just a very enjoyable kind of interaction. So they're always great. I mean, certainly in this season for the first time, really, because I had done virtually nothing with Josh. You know, Peter had chosen to articulate that relationship really through absence. Um, and then we, yeah, we have this scene in the, in the first in the first episode. Um, and you can kind of see why they don't talk very much because it's, yes, it's, uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding and uh, antagonism and sort of um, in that scene, weirdly, Charles ends up being the parent and it's, um, yeah, Philip kind of falls short. And so, uh, but again, really, just really, you know, obviously we only get a, a scene, but it's, um, there's so much to dig into that it means it's always rich. And yeah, and it was really great to get a chance to do some stuff with Josh. Yeah. And then obviously this season as well, we also had Margaret Thatcher coming in and there's a real journey for Philip in the dynamic and how he views her at different points and mm. her political assertions and, you know, from great respect to thinking that she's making the wrong decisions at certain points. And I was interested for you in terms of how you were thinking about the impact for him as someone who, you know, is better informed than the majority of people about every political decision that's going on in the country, but has no ability to actually assert any actions over it. Um, and what that dynamic with Margaret Thatcher kind of brought out in him in watching choices that she was making. Mm. I mean, that's obviously not something that we really specifically, um, specifically address in this season. We have done in, in previous, I mean, obviously that episode seven stuff looks at his feelings about his position and, and the, the basic kind of powerlessness of his position. Um, but yeah, so I mean, it's a, such an interesting undercurrent because you have an alpha male who has no alpha. <laughs> He's, uh, and it's, I would say, I mean, certainly Peter's provocation is it's been 
one of the fundamental ingredients of his life. Now, I'm sure if, you know, Philip was alive and here, he would, uh, I'm sure, shout at us and and, dis- and sort of disagree hotly. But, um, yeah, uh, but I think it, 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 it's, you feel like it's impossible not to kind of notice that, you know, someone who had such an active early career, you know, officer in the Navy, you know, Garland did clearly, you know, very successful kind of leading men and being, you know, um, you know, a man of action, really, and to go into this entirely ceremonial role, which he then obviously created and gave himself a lot to do. But it's, you know, again, it's one of the very rich contradictions of the character and of the show that those two things are kind of together, you know, passivity and someone who is so inherently active. Um, and so, yeah, I think I suppose to a certain degree we see maybe a mixture of those qualities in his response to her, because I think at times in the, in the season he admires her and so sort of sees someone that he kind of relates to in, her, in terms of her kind of strong headedness, her uh, decisiveness, all those sort of leadership qualities. That I think he probably would have would admire and would have. Um, you know, definitely would have implemented himself as a, a naval officer, but but then I guess you know um, he comes to understand you know that there's a sort of uh, there's a madness in her as well. And off the back of that as well, there's it feels like the show has always explored different ways and different spaces that he has kind of found what he finds to be a victory for himself or something that he can really hold on to for just himself. And and one of the moments in this season that it felt like we were exploring that with him was when they hear that a stag has has come onto the property and, you know, everybody's joking about who's going to kill the stag, but there's also a real sense of, no, I'm going to do this because I, I need this victory in essence <laughs> as well. Um, and so I just wanted to ask about scenes like that and how you really find spaces where he is able to take something for himself within the family, even if it is, again, kind of going back to the humour, laced with humour, covering the emotion behind it a little bit. Mm. I mean, I, I think, you know, that moment is, you know, as you say, 90% humour, really. I mean, because I think one of the interesting things, I don't think within the family, his position is up for debate. You know, he's clearly he is head of household. And so... And, you know, that Balmoral episode is an interesting one because my understanding is that those summers in Balmoral are where the closest they get to being an ordinary family and just sort of kicking about. And, you know, you see them in, you know, I mean, obviously for a lot of people, quite unusual clothes, but it's sort of normal clothes for them. And yes, it's the most domestic that they get. And so I think, yeah, similarly, you see him as head of head of household and taking you know taking um that position um which is again you know i guess um another ingredient to you know that sort of tickly feeling of oh look 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 at them while they do that you know um i wonder if it's really like that and then on a separate note i also wanted to ask you about the second season of this way up which just came out because I think it's so interesting to watch the scenes between you and Ashling B because in essence, your character is very much the straight man to her outward exuberant comedy in a lot of those moments. And so when you're sparring off of her, you're not necessarily coming back with a beat in the traditional sense of I'm delivering a line back to you. A lot of it is kind of absorbing that energy. And again, you know, kind of almost similarly to things that you have to do for Philip, figuring out what the internal element of a character is. And so I was very interested in in how you approach that straight man comedic sensibility, which is also masking a lot of vulnerability and fallibility within a character. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I would say with that, the, the touchstone is really the, the truth, I think. Um, but you, yes, you put it very well. Um, I think Richard is funny, but it's um, situational and character funny, not like funny lines, but it's about the response, isn't it? You're right, it's about how he how he responds to stuff and his you know his how hard it is for him to embody how he feels sort of be in touch with his feelings deal with the kind of mushy stuff um is just you know 
how to be intimate, all those um, things, which um, I'm afraid I don't find it very hard to uh, imagine. Um, so, um, so yeah. And then obviously this season, Ashling pushed a little further into uh, sort of what's what's behind the kind of chilly exterior, you know, that we meet in the first season where he's pretty defended and kind of, and then, yeah, and I, I think it's a rather beautiful, something I really love about what she's done with this season is really kind of softened and gone, gone into him a little bit and to find something that's, yeah, also sort of damaged and, um, yeah, just trying to keep up. Um, in, in, in the same way that she is, but in, in the opposite, you know, like the negative image of, of the same conversation. As well. It also makes even the smallest of details so meaningful for him, you know, yeah. laughing at someone's joke outwardly or touching her hand is like a huge intimate act mm. for him in a way that it isn't necessarily for other characters on the show. And we get to see so many more details of that seeping through, even even early on when you're taking Etienne and waving him off at the train station and hugging him. You know, that's a really mm. small everyday thing to hug someone before they get on a train. But for the two of them, it's a huge leap in their relationship as father and son and so do you find your do you find that Ashling's writing really gives a lot of those moments in understanding how much more do you want to pull his guard down how much more does he want to show of that vulnerability or are you also kind of balancing it in your performance a little bit as well uh Ashling is has a very clear idea of all that stuff so it's all kind of written you know she's yeah in, in extraordinary control of the material um, so everything that we're sort of realizing is something that she's um, has imagined. Um, yeah, I mean, I think one of the I'm a big fan just performance. I've always interested by performances that are um, stripped back. You know, the kind of cliche of less is more. I suppose what it, what it can do, as you have put really well, is if you to reduce the palette that much. When you do then put a bit of colour, you it really reads, and so yeah, for someone who is um, as physically restrained as Richard is, then when you see him trying to hug someone, uh, there's just a lot going on, and so and I yeah, I think that's really yeah, it's you know it's it's something that I kind of. Uh, it's sort of sort of acting that I'm sort of always interested in. So it's nice to be given the opportunity to kind of be that kind of simple and that kind of strip back. Yeah, and and jumping back to the crown and the and the way that we were talking before about how there's almost an enjoyment within the restrictive elements because it forces you to think creatively very differently. I just wanted to ask about if there are other characters and other performances where you found a similar space creatively, where there's some sort of limitation to the type of expression of a character or the way that you're approaching them or telling a story that's really kind of fed into you creatively in a similar way. Well, I guess period is always a, so, I mean, the thing that springs to mind is the AMC show, The Terror. And there you're dealing with, um, you know, the physical, social um, manners and etiquettes and, and sort of how society was structured then. And add to that, um, officers, men, all the kind of codes of conduct that are within the Navy and a sort of cramped boat. And so you have a lot of physical stuff that you can call on to, you know, yes, as you say, restrict, how, you know, you're, you can't just go and kind of, you know, high five them or be too tactile, say with, you know, a private, you know, with a, one of the, um, one of the men because you have a decorum to maintain and discipline to maintain and all those things. I actually remember doing a scene with Jared and obviously he's an officer, but it's a scene like I sort of, I sort of hit his arm or something in a way that probably was quite modern actually. And he quite rightly, so in between takes was like, I don't think you should do that. And he was completely right. Like, of course. Yeah. Yeah. That's the sort of me kind of, slipping out into my physicality and sort of, and so those again, yeah, I think invariably, um, you know, restraints are often um, very helpful and creative. Yeah. 
Well, hugely, hugely appreciate you sharing all of that and talking to us all, all right. about The Crown today. Thank you so much, Tobias. Really nice to chat to you. Take care. Bye-bye.